Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to webinar week day number five, and or webinar week number five, day number four. Uh, absolutely delighted today to have Miss Lisa Cole here. Um, no Mark Wilson today. Mark actually gave birth to, uh, to his, or his wife gave birth to their first child um, a few weeks ago, so he's on hospital duty today. Um, so it's just me and Lisa, um, obviously far more Lisa than me, but it's absolutely delighted that you're here. So uh, thank you for, for sharing an hour of your time with us. Um, obviously what we're, we're gonna get into is a little dive into the very exotic um, background that you have within the game. And obviously you're, you're coming from a, a nice island right now, all the way in Antigua. So we'll, we'll, we'll share that story along with many others and, and the lessons that you've learned throughout you know, throughout your career, um, specifically focusing on the benefit of being brave enough to say yes to opportunities. Um, so I think it's a, it's a really unique story that, that I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share with everybody listening now and, and again, uh, on demand. So thank you for being here. Um, before I turn it over to you, Lise, to, to introduce yourself, just for the benefit of, of people here now, please feel free, um, obviously, to pop up with questions if you if you have them. Um, more than more than willing to to engage with with those. So, um, yeah, Lise, if if you could, a little background, a whistle stop tour of the last twenty or so years, and then we'll uh, we'll dive right in. Yeah, I've had a unique path. I think I've been really lucky in my career because. Um, I really knew I wanted to be a coach from uh, a very young age. I started coaching when I was uh, young as um, a player and through high school, through middle school even um, was when I started. So I knew this was a passion of mine really early on. So I um, got out of college even before I graduated. I was still finishing up um, one internship um, hours that I needed to get. I got a job at um, Old Miss, so that was my coaching start. Not really my start, but my start as an, a professional, like actually getting paid. So I went to Old Miss, then I did a stunt at UConn with uh, Lance and Tiras, and uh, then followed that up by a head coaching job in Rhode Island, then traveled to Florida State, worked with Mark Corian and Erica Walsh, Nick Statham, um, a great crew of people um, at Florida State. And then I took a little bit of a pause um, and did a little soul searching. I went to Brazil uh, and I wasn't quite sure the college game was right for me. There's so many things that I love about the game, but um, being in that environment um, in an office a lot more than you're on the field with players, I was really struggling with, but that seems to be like making it, being a head coach at a college or an assistant with um, good people around you. And uh so I was lucky enough, um, Tony DeChico has been one of my uh, mentors, um, and he was starting a youth club and knew that the Women's Professional League was coming. So he was like, come be here, help me with this youth club, help me start something, and then I'd like you to be my assistant with Boston Breakers. So I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't even ask him how much money he was going to pay me. I just said, yes, I'm going, um, opportunity to be in and around you. I'm going to learn and then I'll figure out what's next from there. So that kind of was the real start to my journey. A little bit of um, a stint in the college game after having done youth for a number of years as a young coach and then into semi-professional, then professional soccer. And then that led to some international opportunities um, and some opportunities to do coaching education, which I'm really, um, yeah, I really uh, think is exciting. Yeah, and it's a very... <laughs> It's a very humble explanation of uh, the places you've been and, and who you've got to you got to meet along the way and where you've got to work. Um, obviously, we'll we'll dive into that later. But, but as you touched upon, there is NWSL professional uh, professional experience. There's there's the tours overseas with various youth national teams and World Cup experience, and there's 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 a bunch of it. Um, obviously, blended with the the college piece. So it's it's a fascinating tale, and and honestly, it's one that. Um, I think there's will be will be inspirational for for so many who can can hear it and listen um, and understand it a little bit more. So um, I said to you offline that we've kind of gone through the theme of inspiration and, and five aside teams being pertinent to soccer. Um, instead of making a team with you, what I'm going to ask for are 
the five most instrumental people on your journey? Because as you said, you've, as a young coach, and then obviously where you are uh, now, kind of later in your career, you've worked within teams, you've had teams of people, um, you've obviously been involved with the education platform, you've been both a mentor and a mentee. So if you could, um, if it's possible to, to name just five, um, who would they be in and what was it about them that, that made their support, guidance, friendship um, so, you know, so important to you? Yeah, I mean, I struggled with this. The, uh, yesterday, I was really trying to write down five names. It's hard to, really hard to get down to five. I think, um, for me at least, there's two key um, people and then there becomes, as you start to go down moments in my career, um, there are really people that are instrumental throughout that. So the first two um, are pretty really apparent to me um, and still important to me today is um, Dr. Colleen Hacker, um, sports psychologist for the women's national team in 99. She's a sports psychologist. I think she's the top sports psychologist in the world at the moment. She works with U.S. hockey. She does all kinds of great things. Um, and I was lucky to have her as a college coach and now um, someone that mentored me and really made me think about my craft. Like I always knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a coach, but really made me think about how I wanted to do that and uh, what would be my impact after doing that and um, help me accountable the small details matter and who you are is just as important as what you're doing. Um, and then Tony DiCicco, I mean, that for me, from a soccer perspective um, and just a life perspective, um, he had the most impact on my soccer specific development. And um, obviously who I am as a person, how I approach players. I think as a young coach, I wanted to be like firm and I know things and um, I'm gonna get out there and tell players how um, to do this and what to win and be a little more authoritarian maybe. and um, with Tony, I really learned that it's about players. It's about how we impact players and how we, um, regardless of level, um, deal with those relationships. So um, I continue to learn from him all the time, just even today with, with his passing, because his influence on what other people say and how they go about things keeps coming back to me in so many ways, which is great. Um, after that, it's really hard for me a little bit um, because I think I was really lucky. I grew up in Washington State for the most part, and there were, I didn't know this at the time, but there were just fantastic women in that environment that I was able to see, and therefore um, was able to, I think, be inspired without knowing I was being inspired, without reflection now. Um, but some of those people were like Karen Stanley, Jan's music really stands out. She's my ODP coach and also a coach educator. Um, and somebody I had on my coaching courses, um, which was really cool to see a woman in that environment. And uh, Debbie Barlow, those are some names that come to mind and that kind of core group as a youth player and as a young female coach, seeing women in leadership and how they manage um, what is sometimes, or is most of the time a men's world. Um, and then I'd say like the head coaches I worked for, Steve Holman at Old Miss, we had so much fun. Uh, being young coaches together and really learning um, together. That journey was really special. Lenny's a legend at UConn and Mark Corian, I learned. I, I think I still end up learning things from him because I, um, at the time, I didn't realize I was picking those all these little things up, but how he puts together staff and inspires people um, and his attention to detail, again, is really cool. So. Those were those were like groups of people I think that um, really influenced me. But if you made me pick two more or three more, I think I would have to say um, Greg Ian. I don't know if you know Greg, but played played for the Tacoma Stars. I watched um, I watched them growing up. Was an avid fan of fan of everything, um, and I think that um, he just had a great influence in my career. He's the first youth coach that I saw jump on a field with, you know, 150 kids and have them all tuned in, locked in, doing what he was doing, excited about the game. And that ability really just stood out to me. Um, so early as a coach, um, 
I really liked it, uh, um, needed and uh, was appreciative of his, his support. And then as a professional coach, um, actually when I got fired from the Boston Breakers, um, one of the people that reached out to me was um, Shellis Hyman. And he had just gone through a similar thing with, um, with FC Dallas. And I think um, for me, it was just really special for him to reach out to me to say, I know what you're going through. This isn't going to define you as a coach. And to um, have us be able to share the, that experience of being really let down by a club and by an organization that you've given everything to. Um, so quickly and without a lot of uh, reason. So, and he he was my on my B license with me, so he knew me early on in my career. We'd had other touch points, but that moment really stands out for me. And um, we're on the United Soccer Coaches educational staff together, and um, every time I see him, it's I just learn and it's a pleasure. So I would say Shellis as well. I think I gave you four hard names. You can. I think. Yeah. I think you have given me you've given me four hard ones and then maybe six or seven in the team. So that that works. Um, There's but no, so many good women out there. I mean, I could go into ODP and then I'd say other people, Sue Ryan, Nancy Feldman. So I think this that's one of the things I've been blessed with is so many opportunities to be around great women coaches and, and great coaches. Yeah, and I was going to to joke people who who know me personally speak about. The amount of different hats that I've been fortunate to wear, but but you are somebody who maybe wears even more, right? With the different roles that you've been able to play over time, and like you said, it's just so important, I think, to, to any coach, the value of networking, but of of broadening that reach of your circle, right? Because all of those people become your people. Like everyone that you've listed, you could now turn to for for guidance, support, potentially opportunities. Um, yeah. And as you said, like you, you've been able to continue to learn from many at different stages. So it's 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 super super important, and and obviously leads nicely into uh, to, the, to the value of saying yes to things, which is what we're gonna we're gonna dive into a little bit more. Um, obviously, these you, you you referenced your background starting with the collegiate game and um, going from almost coast to coast or north to south in some instances. Um, How how did you how were you brave enough to to pick up life and say yes? So you say with Tony when he rang, the question there wasn't a hesitation. And obviously anybody who was fortunate enough to know Tony like we did would would say that well that makes perfect sense. But how easy you know how have you found it yourself so capable of you know you're in Antigua now you've been in Papua New Guinea you've you've travelled the world like. How how is it that you you've come to say yes, and, and what advice would you would you give to the coaches listening now or later about that type of mentality to to how you built a career? Yeah, I think um, I don't know if it was my ability to say um, yes or my inability to say no or my um, just plain my my nativity to be like, well, I don't know any better, so I'm gonna go for it. Um, at times, um, but for me, it's always worked. Like for me, I've always um, looked at people that I want to be like. So, you know, I see some similar to why I ended up on this uh, podcast. I see you doing good uh, work. I like what you're doing. I just reached out to say, hey, I appreciate what you're doing. You know, and then that that leads to different con conversations. So I think um, not being afraid to reach out to people that you see and enjoy and try to find ways to be in and around those people is really important. And um, I think for me, I just was always seeking more. Like how, so I'm doing, I know what I'm doing in my environment. I know what works here, what, what works in California, what works in uh, this environment. And I think that seeking of um, how it can continue to improve and be better was why I always end up saying yes. And I just really, have enjoyed every experience. People often ask me, well, what age, what do you prefer to coach? What level do you prefer to coach? And the answer is, I just love coaching. I, and I think I have a unique skill set in that I'm able to, um, you know, 
be able to rise or lower my expectations or the way I speak to people in different environments um, based on who they are. Um, that, ha that has allowed me to be successful also in a multitude of environments. I do think some people are uniquely suited to being in different specific environments. Um, but for me, I really just have enjoyed the journey and getting to be in around uh, more people. So when somebody asks, hey, are you interested in going to Papua New Guinea? I'm like, well, where is that first? And yeah, sounds great. Like, you know, do the, are the kids going to um, be here to learn? Are they, am I going to be in, able to impact them as people? And if the answer to that is yes, then um, I'm in. If I'm on the field with players that are eager to learn. It's why I'm not a teacher, to be honest. Early in my career, people wanted me to be a teacher because that's what you did. You didn't become a soccer coach. You became a teacher who then coached soccer. And I was just like, no, I want to be a soccer. I want to be, I feel like I'm a teacher, but I want to be on the field with students that always are engaged in whatever that that topic is. And for me, that method is football or soccer in the U.S. I've get, gotten used to saying football because I'm in a football I have, I hear. moment. Because I've gone the other way. I've gone the other way all too often. Um, <laughs> it, it is. And, you know, Lisa, I, what I appreciate and, and a lot of the conversations that we've had has been on authenticity and understanding yourself and knowing your own values. And I think what you've just referenced there in terms of just the sheer love of, of the profession and the game and the impact that you get to make on people. Um, I referenced in the conversation with Sky at the very start of all of this series, we obviously will talk more about Tony later, but the thing that was always most profound for me with him was the impact that he continued to have and, and how broad that reach went, right? We talk about plant trees you'll never see grow. And, and I think what you're doing is being able to leave your your own little stamp in so many different pockets. And, and that's that's incredible, right? The game gives you an opportunity to access and empower and motivate and inspire people that otherwise you know, you said it might be an inability to say no, but I'm, I'm sure there are there are an abundance of people out there that are grateful for you having the, the, the bravery and willingness to just say yes, right? And, and like you said, be be on an island where you didn't know where in the world it was, but let you've you've left a legacy there based on, you know, the, the willingness to to take a risk and to put yourself maybe outside of a, of a comfort zone. Um, and I think just just hearing why you felt so comfortable in doing that is it's wonderful. So thank you for. The honesty there. Um, obviously, we can joke about you're in Antigua, the sun's shining, you've got palm trees in the background. It looks obviously pretty fantastic, even if you are on on lockdown right uh, right now. It can't always have been easy though, Lise. It, it can't always have been been simple. Um, plain sailing. Obviously, you've left people behind. You're you're in new countries, new climates, new cultures. Um, can you talk? candidly and honestly about any of the struggles or sacrifices that you've had to make that may have come with you know kind of the the career and the um I guess the the, the profile that you've built for yourself and the career you've been able to have just if we yeah could. I think when people go into coaching you really have to know why you coach and you have to realize that maybe over time's time that why you coach might change as your circumstance change you know um, as a young coach coming in, you're full of energy, you have all the time in the world, everything um, you do revolves around the sport. And I think the sport kind of demands that from us, that we always are available for our players. We're available for our players sometimes um, more than we're available for our friends and our families at times. So for me, um, I look at it differently a little bit. I don't come from a strong family background, so my Soc soccer or, or football, where football is, those people have always been my family. So it's been really easy for me to make those. I'm not leaving a group of um, people that are calling or bugging me constantly. Why are you not home? Why are you not home? I've been a bit transient in my career. You guys can all see that from the pa uh, places I've gone. I have good core of people I consider my family, but they're in the game and around the game. And so um, their understanding, they um, are able to be flexible when I'm in town, when I'm not in town, we make the best of it. So I think that's something that when uh, people make a decision 
to be in coaching, you have to really know um, also how you're going to fit your life into that because it is going to be um, mixed. And um, to deny that is kind of a little bit, um, again, um, looking at it with blinders on. So how are you going to mix things? And I've watched um, my friends, you know, Erica Walsh is a perfect one. We're great friends. We were assistants together at uh, Florida State. And um, I spent a lot of time in state col colleges where I kind of, I call it home basing, um, my home base there when I'm in the States. And, you know, you watch her go from a young coach um, climbing this ladder to somebody who's in the last <clears throat> sorry, last couple of years, got married, has two kids now, and who she is as a coach and her passion as a coach hasn't changed, and her uh, attention to detail and how she gets things done, but because of her experience, she doesn't need to do the grind in the same way that she had to do the grind as a young coach, so I don't think she does less now. I think she's more efficient now with her time, and she um, makes time for what, those things that are important. Uh, to her and spending time with um, Jason and Addie and Kaika are the priority at time. time. So balancing life, how are you going to find balance within your soccer career is really important. And just knowing who you are, uh, for me, I'm, diff I'm different than other people. I, 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 I thrive in, I like get adopted easily, I think, um, by families. Um, and so I always feel like wherever I am, that's where I live. So I live currently in Antigua. I'm a, I say that regularly and people are like, no, you don't. You're, you're just there doing that job. I'm like, no, I'm here. I'm where do I spend most of my time? I'm in Antigua right now. And then I joke, I home based in state college. So, um, you still have to know where your people are and how you're going to manage your career and know what's really important to you. The game is where I find happiness. So if you find happiness in the game, but you also need these other things, um, Marsha McDermott is, um, a good role model for me and it has been a mentor especially in the professional game as I was getting started and she loves to read she likes to have her time away from people um, so how she's carved out a career where and she, she was the first woman to win a um, international or a um, professional women's championship in the WUSA I mean she's done remarkable things and led and then she's taken times away from the game because that balance works for her so um, Knowing yourself is really important as you go on the journey um, and re recognizing that you will change as um, you get older, your priorities will change. Yeah, and we were speaking, my, my days are, are blurring, but we were having a conversation recently about um, acknowledging that there's going to be roadblocks and and obstacles and hurdles just like in a game and it may have been yesterday actually with with Spratty and, and the conversation about goalkeeping like we will make a mistake just that acknowledge that that's going to happen just like in in coaching we're going to acknowledge that there will be time away there will be we will miss people's you know we will have to pack up bags and say yes to stuff like I think getting ahead of it and just like you say knowing yourself and being comfortable with it is super important because you know there are obviously along the along the pathway there's there's going to be there's going to be those types of opportunities where it's like, look, if I guess if I'm surprised by this, if I'm surprised that, you know, I'm in a foreign country and I'm, I'm missing a home cooked meal or I'm whatever it might be like, then that, that might, the feeling there might kind of escalate above and beyond where it's like, okay, well, I know that this is going to happen. It's natural. It's, it's kind of going to be easier to, to absorb. So um, again, fascinating. And I think so important, the message of just, in yourself and um again the, the, the hashtag football family is one that gets banded about but it's so true right it's just the ability to make make a family out of your your peer group um you're in antigua now you obviously were in papua new guinea um how how on earth have you been able to connect with the players and the people that that you see on a day-to-day -day basis now obviously so different than mainland USA um so different than some of the, the big cities and states that you grew up in like you have a first-hand experience of, of soccer really being the world's game so talk to us about that like when you first got to Papua New Guinea how were you interacting you know what did they know about you how was the adjustment like how did it all come together 
Yeah, I think um, when you do things like um, go overseas and work with these teams, um, you know there is going to be a little bit of um, a time constraint. Like, how long are you going to be able to do that? Either for a funding reason or, um, you know, in Papua New Guinea's case, um, they were host hosting a U20 World Cup. They didn't have a team prior to getting – the bid to host a World Cup, so we had to, within a little over a year, find a team, find players, find a training ground, come up with a plan, and then actually try to compete with the best countries in the world in our age group. So no big, that, yeah, no big deal. <laughs> that task was like, you had to embrace what that meant. Um, there were challenges I didn't foresee, and I think that's always going to be the case. And then there's some things you just know going in, like are we going to win a game? You know, especially, I think maybe before the draw, we thought, okay, well, if we get one of the, one of these two teams in our group, maybe we have a chance. Um, and that's being like ridiculously optimistic as the head coach of that, that team. Um, but you know, this game, um, anybody can win on any given day. Um, ultimately if the ball bounces the right way. So, and if you do the work ahead of time to make that happen. So, we were optimistic, but then the draw happens. We get Sweden, Brazil, Sweden, who won Euros that year. We get Brazil, who's um, championships out of their confederation. And we get North Korea, who won the previous U-17 World Cup and are defending U-20 champions. So then you go, okay, well, what's the goal of participating in this event? And um, I think I had ideas about what my goals would be before I left. But um, once I got there, the challenge is were different. Um, I don't know if you know this and or people know this, but like 90% of women are sexually assaulted or abused in Papua New Guinea. Uh, violence is rampant. Um, girls are still still sold in essence or uh, given a bride prize um, because there's parts of Papua New Guinea that are still living in tribal villages. So um, the best example I can give in the sh in the short amount of time is. Um, the, there's not an infrastructure. So if the, if the road gets blown out by a flood, which happens, I would say monthly when it's the rainy season in Garoka, um, passing the highways is very difficult. And how they pass the highways are in these vans, these buses, these vans that go up and down, up and down, and you pay, um, your, to ride up and down them. Well, a Highlander hadn't played, um, a person from Madang. So people from the tribe of Medang were sitting on the roadway where this washout had happened and you needed help to get across this bridge and literally slashing people with machetes, not killing them or doing, but doing harm, serious harm to anybody. And the facial structure and the, um, the colors of people in Papua New Guinea are very tribal. So um, the darkness of their skin is different the bridges of their nodes are different. They can pick each other out like, oh, you're from Bougainville, you're Medang, you're from Garoka. So there's all these different tribes within this really small space. So if you belong, if you were a Highlander traveling down, you were getting slashed. Well, I had kids, we'd given them a, a weekend break. I had kids in Medang. I can't get kids back for two weeks because we have a tribal war going on on the roads until the chief of this tribe goes to this tribe, donates pigs, cows, and they do a um, campfire and let by, hunts be guy, bygones. That's the type of things that were happening um, that you just are, can never be um, prepared for as a coach. So when I got there, I had um, some good people. M Margaret Q, she's still there. Um, and a, uh, Barbara, who's the highest licensed coach now in Papua New Guinea, she's actually coaching a boys team in Medang. Really proud of who she is right now and the things she's doing there. Um, so she was my assistant. And so I would ask Rachel, she's from Medang. Okay, who are the best players in this age group? Give me a list of players. Okay, great. Margaret, who are the best players in this age group? Okay, she's from um, an island. Um, I'm blanking on the island right now. That's just off. Um, I'll come back to it. But she's from another little tribal place. I get a list. And she lives in Port Moresby. So Margaret's list had people 
or from Port Moresby and it starts with a K, um, this other town. Rachel's list only had people from a day. And I said, okay, well, Rachel, do you, they only recommended what they call their one talks. So their immediate family, people they consider their family. And it, I couldn't get Margaret to say this player was good. And I couldn't get Rachel to say this player was good. And I'm standing there looking at them. And then there's, there's a player that can't run from here to there. And they're vouching for her. They're saying that she can play. And I'm like, she cannot play. You guys, look, she physically cannot do the demands. But because of their culture, you don't talk bad about your one talk. And so somebody raises their hand, they belong to your tribe. And if they're in the hierarchy above you, you have to put them in. You have to put them forward. So that was the really hard lesson um, early on because I had this list that I thought was a good list of potential players. We got them into a training camp, and I was like, wait a second. This can't be the best players out there. It, that can't be who we're picking to play in the World Cup. So um, – we lost time. We actually lost almost three months because Margaret had gone out scouting and said she didn't find um, anybody in any of these other places. So, um, you know, we found Nicola was from Bougainville. If um, they hadn't brought me in or someone, an expat in, um, they don't go find a kid from Bougainville because they don't even, in Papua New Guinea, they don't even consider that really part of Papua New Guinea. So um, I think they miss like everywhere they have this preconceived notion of uh, loyalty like that it matters where people are from okay it's more rewarded to get more of your people and so that was really hard and then when that we did get the players the best players we could find in um some players said no family said no we don't want to embarrass ourselves we don't want our children to be embarrassed on that stage in that country um so i had some top players that their families wouldn't allow them to come um, I had some players that, um, really struggled in the environment. Um, I had a player, two or three of my players. Yeah. Ultimately on the final team, two of my players were moms, but three in the initial camp that were moms. So, um, they came into camp and now they're going to be away from their um, sons or daughters. Um, and think about that. Most of my team was 17 and some of them had two and three year old kids. So just, do the math and figure out what that looks like. So um, just some challenges you didn't, I didn't um, expect to have when putting together a team to play in the U20 World Cup. Uh, Michelle French was the head coach for the U.S. team. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about what your her challenges were, and I was like, yeah, I wish I had those challenges. I just don't. But, um, yeah, it's a bit different. But they were here to try to win a World Cup, and we were here – to introduce the fact that women can be strong, women should be treated um, uh, respectfully, and that um, and to say to women that they matter, that young girls matter, and that um, they can be leaders in the community. So it's different messaging and different goals for both teams. And the same event. Yeah, uh, and yeah. I mean, it couldn't probably couldn't be more different. Um, how? Obviously, there's no coaching courses that teach you how to, to deal with that. There's no books on what to do when you find yourself in that situation and how to, you know, deal with people at tribal warfare. I mean, that's just something that obviously none of us, I'm assuming, on the line can, re can relate to. Um, so how did you go from all the experiences you'd had previously to being to being placed in that environment embracing i guess the challenges with that culture how, like how did you then build a team so you've finally got people from different tribes it sounds like together that wouldn't normally get on you've finally been able to you know pull people away from from families and all the difficult circumstances so what was the process then like talk to us about how you went from a collection of people to one kind of i guess one single team with it with a common goal in mind like how did you, how did you do that? And was language a barrier? I, that's my naivety. So well, yeah, uh, pigeon is there. Um, well, each tribe there's over 360 languages in Papua New Guinea. So from one, if I was in one area, they're speaking one uh, dialect of um, dialect, and then if you go somewhere else, you're speaking something else. So we went and did a fun run one time, and 
Um, I was really angry because the um, players weren't paying it. I was trying to pay attention. I obviously couldn't understand the language, but I was paying attention. I look at my players and they're not listening to uh, the, this governor, I guess, um, speak would be in our terms what he meant. And, and I'm like, why are you guys not listening to what he's having to say? Doesn't it mean anything to you? And they're like, oh, we don't know what he's saying. Like, Cause he was speaking a language they didn't know. Um, so they were kind of like looking around like, cause it's boring to listen to something if you can't understand. So I was like, okay, well we, I gave them a little bit of slack on the fact that they weren't eagerly listening to what was happening. So pigeon is their, what they speak on the streets or with each other. Um, but, and I know lick lick of that. Um, there are some common things that come, um, through with, um, like counting and things like that. So counting, it's like one plus, two plus, three plus. So they've incorporated the English language to that. So that was easy. Um, and if I spoke uh, pigeon, it was like they went crazy. So I tried to do the best I could with some of that. But I think, uh, but English is taught in schools. They're a British, um, now Australian country. The country's 40. Well, at the time they were had just celebrated their 40th anniversary. Imagine that I'm older than the country, the older than they had independence. So a lot of things relatively new to um, governance and managing um, themselves as people. So yeah, it's interesting times, but I think the key for me was embrace the challenges. And I, I, I've had challenges. I mean, I was the head coach of the Boston Breakers, my first professional. We um, as supposed to be the head coach in WPSA WPS the year the WPS folded so we restarted did a WPSL elite season which was an in-between season and then um, this is now NWSL's back first big pro season and the, um, we just passed the anniversary of the Boston um, marathon bombing that happened with on in my first season so challenges like this happen to coaches in um, in the U.S. there's um, moments that happen I remember being a young coach at a, uh, as a head coach and having um, ch uh, players suffer things through life, big life things. And so we as coaches, um, I think that's the thing young people have to realize is that so much of what we do is going to be more than uh, X's and O's. We love to talk X's and O's. We could get on here and that, we could talk about formations and I'd be in, but really how we impact people and really make movements with our teams is when we uh, learn these other uh, skills and for me it was embracing their culture what that looked like and then talking about how um, some of the things that were part of their culture maybe wouldn't allow us to have success so how do we change those things how do we become unified yeah can you can you talk just a, a tiny bit more on that stuff because that's that's fascinating yeah, I think for me, what it came down to is um, expectations. Like, what were our expectations of each other in camp? Um, if you have something in Papua New Guinea, so if I, if you leave your notebook and I pick up your notebook, that notebook is now mine. And you know that, and I know that. Well, when we were doing laundry, they would wash their own laundry. They put their um, things up. Well, it's really easy to go grab what was a hot commodity in Papua New Guinea, somebody's sports bra, for instance, because there's not a lot of sports bras running around Papua New Guinea. We had to bring those in uh, for the most part. So if I took it off the clothesline, it's now mine. We can imagine girls fighting about those type of things. And so we had to talk about what respect was, like a respect for others' property and things like that. Because in their culture, if you don't keep it, then it becomes someone else. So um, I, we talked a lot about that, about how, um, we had to respect each other's boundaries. When was the time, um, to, um, to really share who they were as well. They weren't very open about sharing their own journey and kind of admitting some of the challenges and struggle they have. Very proud, um, getting them to speak, like to actually have their head up and look at me. Um, I went through some video the other day. Um, because I was looking at, I'm using the camcorder I use for that um, thing. So I found some hard drive stuff and I had made them practice doing interviews, right? We're going to, we're going to be on the national stage. We got to practice doing interviews. The first ones are like this, their heads down. I can't hear them, you know, and then you watch some of the interviews for the world cup on uh, FIFA.com and some of those things and they're standing strong. And those were the things that had to matter to me, not what we did on the field. 
And we had three goals going into the World Cup um, that I'm really, really proud of and um, that would be success for us. If we came out of the World Cup doing these things, this was what was going to measure our success. And the first was we're not going to quit. So you watch a lot of teams that are overmatched by teams and, you know, that fourth goal goes in, that fifth goal goes in, that sixth goal goes in you know it's going to happen. I just had this happen with senior women's national team in Antigua and Olympic qualifying, and I was livid. They quit. I'm okay with us getting killed, but do not quit. Like, keep working. Keep trying. Let's get something out of the game. Let's show in moments our qualities and uh, still have hard tackles at the end. So that was something we weren't going to do. We were going to give our best effort from the start of the game to the end of the game. So at the 90th minute, we were never game fit. You can watch the game, games about 30 minutes into each half. We were about 30 minutes fit for each half. So we could do 30 minutes and then maybe 20 minutes in the second half. And then our fitness level just went, we just weren't there. We didn't have the base. Um, so we talked about what that would look like. You know, work back into your position. Make sure you're in the right spots. Do the little things well. And um, to the best of their ability, they were still finding good moments late in the game when the game was clearly won by the other team, you know? Um, and then we didn't want to, we, we didn't want to be beat by 10 or more. So we wanted, we wanted to hold at nine. Don't be, and our worst score was nine zero, um, but we wanted to hold at nine. So no one got us into double uh, digits and we improved each uh, game on a score um, differential. Brazil actually, um, we played first and then Sweden and then uh, North Korea. Um, so in Brazil, they, that was the nine zero game. And I think I thought that game could be a little bit better for us because we were fresher and more energetic and, but the motions of watching them walk out from the tunnel, I think they were all bawling, <laughs> but most of them were bawling as the, as Nash, as they walked out into that stage, you can just imagine being, you know, 17, 18 years old and playing in a world cup for your country. Um, after some of them picking up the game a year, a year, you know, playing the game for 12 months. So I think the first game overwhelmed us emotionally a little bit and we recovered. Um, but we just held to our goals. And um, the last one was we were going to score a goal. And some, I get this from Tony and um, he always believed that, and I think this is actually from Diane, his wife, that you can will things to happen. You can, if you really believe, you can, you know, so if you sit around and loom and gloom about things, oh, it's, it's good, we're going to get killed, blah, blah, and you create this reality, well, the reality comes true. Well, in the same way, um, you can create an alternate reality. And I sometimes swear, especially in Boston, we'd be walking out onto the field. The players would be sure, be sure that the, it's going to thunderstorm. He, and he's just walking out. I love my job as usual, shouting, I love my job. And I'm asking him, hey, do you think we're going to, what are we going to do if we need to go inside? And he's like, oh no, the clouds are going to clear. They're going to clear. Meanwhile, I'm staring at gray clouds. But as, as, as he's speaking, you know, you see them starting to like blow away and get further in the distance. And I think that was a little bit what happened with that goal is we started about talking it about early, it early. Um, I brought in Ann Cook, um, who's uh, on Erica Walsh's staff at Penn State, and had her work on our counterattacking. We made it a really big priority, like, here's how we're going to score. Um, and we did. We scored on a great counterattack. Um, we made that reality true. I thought that was a possibility maybe in the um, – maybe would happen against Brazil because they're defending. It's not always a strength of theirs. But in that particular World Cup, they actually were a solid uh, defensive group. Is they put some time into that um, as a country, and um, so we didn't get a ton of chances. We actually had more chances to get Sweden, but um, but we score. And not only do we score against North Korea, we tie it one-one. So we're tied with North Korea at some point. You know, this is something other teams, U.S. didn't score against North Korea. So um, I think there was a small um, earthquake in Papua New Guinea that day. And um, people from FIFA will say to, to me, you know, they're in the box. And people are crying. 
that's how it emotionally move people because of all the challenges um, one these young women have um, and how it just changed we changed how people look at young women in that society um, we had a campaign the whole time uh, in violence in violence we did several walks around that um, so it was just amazing to have us um, for us we found success in that World Cup I'm really proud of that uh, group and um, I think you know we got that game that goal because of um, our belief uh, we didn't do a good job celebrating we didn't quite know what to do we practiced celebrating over and over again too and we still didn't know what to do um, but it was um, yeah it's pretty remarkable and um, makes it really special when you're able to actually have them be rewarded for the hard work they put in that year yeah for sure I mean that's just that's just incredible like I think of the impact that many of us go into this career to try to have on the people in in our trust and in our care but clearly like that experience you know you again it goes so so far beyond just the game of football right like it's the, the power of the sport to unify countries and cultures and, and obviously to change people's lives that, that that you clearly did it's it's fascinating um really fascinating so how are you obviously we we spoke about Papua New Guinea there. You're in Antigua, you're the senior national team coach, the women's national team coach for, for Antigua and Bermuda. How are you taking some of those lessons that you've learned in the past and applying it to, to what you're doing right now? Is, is there stuff that, that transfers? Is there things that you wish you'd have done differently that you're now doing now? Is there anything that kind of sticks out from that experience? Um, I think... I think I did a better job and am doing a better job kind of listening first. Um, I think I, with Papua New Guinea, I knew, we had a big task and I knew a short time uh, frame. I was asked good questions coming into Papua New Guinea of the Federation. I'm really proud of um, who they want to be, um, not maybe um, always um, who they have been, um, but who they want to be in, in their role in women's football um, and how they want to grow the game within the culture. The cultures, I, I think I listened more to figure out what some of the pitfalls may be where Papua New Guinea I jumped in and then realized what the uh, pitfalls were it's like okay you're gonna go do this you're gonna go do this you're gonna do, go do this and we did all this work for uh, basically two months and then came back with lists that um, that had no, were not helpful so we lost some time there where here I really tried to be a little bit better in um, you know figuring out what the culture is what they need what they want um, to be their legacy uh, we started a women's league. Um, we actually have um, one set of games remaining in a playoff uh, set to be played. Um, that has been fantastic, drawing great crowds. And um, we called it the Antigua Women's Football League and not a Premier League on purpose because um, I created a league with parity. I think some, one mistake we make sometimes is we start these women's leagues, and they had started a league before. Um, and all the best players go and play with each other because they want to play with each other. And um, I threatened the draft system with them, but really what we came up with um, was an allocation. So looking at where players wanted to play, um, who were the top players in the country, and what clubs they wanted to play. So we listened to the players. Here's where I'd like to be. They picked three. They had to pick um, their top five teams, clubs they would go to. And then the clubs picked who they wanted. And um, we capped how many national team players you could have on a club. Um, and we just made sure that across the board, for the most part, um, that every team would be competitive in the league. Well, when there's competition in a game, people want to watch. So the uh, fans have actually enjoyed the games. But when you go and you watch a game that's 6-0, it's not very appealing to watch. So I think I learned some of those things about, like, um, what's going to lead to success, even though it's hard on the front end, um, doing it right, the more difficult way um, is easier, even though it doesn't seem like it at the beginning. And I would advise this to our youth people and leaders at the moment, um, really thinking about what you want it to look like and not just rushing to put something in place. Uh, that makes you look good in the short term or in short moment. Um, but to think about long term, 
what do we want to get to? And that's what the approach I've kind of um, taken with Antigua is what do we want to get to? And um, I commend the ABFA that they have um, a commitment and I hope they'll continue to have a commitment even through this adversity to uh, investing in uh, Antigua um, over the next two, three, five years and not just a quick, hey, let's hire a U.S. coach, get her in here for Olympic qualifying and then see you later because that's um, not going to lead to any um, actual changes. Right. And it's it's so interesting you, you kind of say that. Obviously, we had Tony and then on the other the other day and I think a lot of people took so much from him from the idea of uh, of leadership strategies and just as you said here listening listening so that it's sustainable and successful in the long term versus versus short term right like we don't want to we were talking again there's analogies of um filling in potholes like we don't want to just surface we don't we just fill over the top if we're not filling in underneath like we don't want to because it's all going to It'll, it'll end eventually, right? So you just want to try to have an Antigua here and you'll be repaving yeah. and resurfacing them every other. I mean, we have an island that's 14 miles by 11 miles big and you can't drive faster than like two, three miles because you're going pothole to pothole and they repave all the time, but they don't do it properly. So it doesn't, it doesn't sustain. So it doesn't it's yeah. no, so. So it, but it is, it's, it, it's an easy one. It's, I think it's it's a humbling reflection from you. You said just being prepared to be the, the, the person who's ultimately going to make the decision, but being willing to gain as much feedback and insight as possible to make that successful. So thank you, obviously, for that. Um, we are coming up to, to the end of the, the hour that um, we wanted to try to, to, to be conscious of, of your time with. Um, I would like to close, though, Lise, because I am, um, I am selfish in this way with it. I'd like another Tony story, uh, obviously from, from your perspective of on your journey, the value of, of mentors to turn around to, obviously when you're saying yes and you find yourself in foreign lands and you find yourself going through something as, as a young up and coming coach that you've never seen before, um, or as you said, just the shoulder to, to turn to sometimes for advice and guidance and like speak to the coaches about about the importance of mentorship and having that network around you so that saying yes to the opportunities like the ones that, that you've spoken you've spoken about are, are more possible they're more attainable yeah I, I i just think i mean i've said this throughout this that i feel like really blessed with the people that the game has given me um, and the people that have become my uh, family and i and um for me to, tony was yeah, he was a mentor, but he was a father figure. He was a good friend. And um, I think 20 plus years, I was able to intimately be around him regularly. And to watch just how he not how he coached. I mean, that was remarkable. How he did coaching education, how he impacted people, how he ran a camp and impacted kids. All those things were remarkable. But um, for me, the biggest takeaway is just how he lived. So to try to think of uh, us, people always want these short stories. But for me, my biggest takeaway from Tony was just how authentic he was every day and what he did. So we can get, I can get prepped up here. I can put everything together and, okay, I'm going to be really prime and proper about how I go about things and talk really educated and sound really smart for an hour. But um, he would, he could do that, but he didn't do that on when it was on call he did that every day and in front of anybody and everybody so whether or not you were um a youth soccer coach you were a dad who had a son or daughter who wanted to help them be a better goalkeeper he took the same time spoke with the same passion um and just was very authentic in um who he was as a coach um so for me, that that's my, when I think of him, I just think of this um, this person that led how he talked about servant leadership. You know, he's the first person to grab the bag of balls. He's the first person to be like, even in the pro, pros, when we have equipment managers and people to move goals and pick up cones for us, please come over here. Let's go move this goal. 
you know, you got me and Tony moving a goal and five equipment managers standing over there doing nothing. Um, but that's who he was to his core in every moment. It's like, come on, let's go, let's, let's do this. I'm in this with you. And, um, there's a million stories I've listened. Sky told some stories. I, I, but for me, it's hard to pick one that says, okay, this is, this is what I take away from all that 20 years of, of time with um, an incredible man. Yeah, no, and I think it's, I think it's more like you've referenced the impact, the day-to-day -day stuff and the profound impact that having somebody like him in your life, what it, what it leads to, right? And like you're saying, the, the lessons that you kind of learned along the way and the way that you now try to, to conduct yourself in certain situations with, with him in mind, even obviously after his passing. So it's, um, I just think it's, it's so important as, as young coaches, as, as aspiring coaches that you've got, you've got those people. And it's kind of a call to action for everybody that, that listens to these conversations to say, you know, go and try and find that circle because obviously so many people that have, have built careers and a lifetime in the game have, have got it. And the benefit both personally and professionally is, is so vast when you, you know, not everybody is obviously going to get a Tony, um, but yeah you can find those people that, that the impact that it can have on, on your career is is a significant one um so now look thank you uh, it is impossible to to take 20 years and put it into a sentence or two um for sure yeah. but appreciate obviously the insight that you've given so um at least that that is us up to to an hour um it is as i said an absolutely fascinating journey um a fascinating experience and you know you could do a whole coaching course on how to deal with uh tribal leaders that don't want to let your players play i'm sure uh, everybody who has challenges with parents would uh would trade their parent challenges for for that in a heartbeat um so yeah challenges look a little different but the truth is there 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 are uh, similarities in every culture they just look a little different yeah yeah i'm not sure that having machetes swiped though as as much as some of them might want to um that's that's definitely that's definitely out there um but seriously thank you obviously for, for freeing up the time today it's it's really appreciated um i'm sure that everybody who gets to listen to this there's there's so much to take away from it so um just for the for the people that are, that are listening now or later um obviously where where can they find a little bit more of you lease where could they come to for advice or just to see what what you're up to yeah well i think um the easiest way is to reach out via Twitter. I'm at, at uh, Lisa Cole, uh, 22 um, on Twitter. I'm the same in Instagram and um, on Facebook. I also have a um, Lisa dot, I think it's Lisa dash Cole um, website. So you can look up that um, where I have some ideas on what success looks like um, in the game. And um, I'm also the director of uh, United Soccer Coaches goalkeeping stuff. So if you're interested in goalkeeping things there, you can find me there with their courses and stuff like that. So a couple different places. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Well, thank you again so much. Um, we'll obviously get this, this turned around and um, people listening now, it's going to be a little bit strange, but um, we'll obviously get this online so people can, can see it after the fact. But thank you. Thank you for your hour. Thank you for your time, for your insight. And um Stay safe over there. I hope it's it's not not too bad having to be cooped up inside all day. So, um, yeah. But yes, please. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Keep up the good work. It's been uh, nice to listen to the things you're doing. Thank you very much.